Hello, everyone, and thank you. To, uh, welcome to phyloseminar.org. Uh, the current theme is phylogenetic invariants, uh, which are polynomial relationships on data generated from a tree. In this series of three talks, we're hearing from three perspectives on invariants and how they may be used to make inferences. First, we heard from Marta Castanellas Rios, who introduced the topic and brought us up to date. Then we heard from Laura Kubatko de describing coalescent based inference using invariants. And today, Barbara Holland will describe Markov invariants and how they differ from classical phylogenetic invariants. I remind you that the Q&A app is gone now, so you can ask questions through Twitter or IRC as described in the attending section of the Phylogenetic website. As I mentioned, today's speaker is Barbara Holland. Uh, Barbara completed a PhD in mathematical biology at Massey University in New Zealand, followed by postdoctoral studies at the Ruhr Universität Bochum in Germany, and then further study at the Allen Wilson Center for Molecular Ecology and Evolution in New Zealand. She was a mathematical mathematics lecturer and researcher at Massey, then joined the mathematics department at University of Tasmania, Australia, where she is associate professor. Welcome, Barbara, and thanks for participating. Thanks very much, Eric. It's um, just a yeah, a super pleasure to be invited along as part of this um, this series. And yeah, I'm very honoured and humbled to be uh, teaming up with Marta and with um, and with Laura. So um, is my screen visible? The screen share looks perfect. Okay, brilliant. All right. So my aim for today is to basically talk through a recent um, paper um, that was co-authored with Jeremy Sumner, Amelia Taylor, and Peter Jarvis. Now, of these characters, we've got uh, uh, Jeremy and Peter on the left there. They're also at the University of Tasmania. Um, Amelia Taylor was variously at uh, Colorado and then at Oregon, and I think now in Seattle, as <laughs> we're actually giving the talk. Um, and so um, you'll notice that my name is third in this list here, and the good reason for that is I think um, really, I guess, the, the sort of intellectual um, leadership on this project really came from, from Jeremy, and the, the stuff that I'm going to be talking about sort of flows through from a lot of ideas he and Peter had sort of been working on for quite a while, sort of coming out from, from, his, from his thesis and onwards. And so, um, obviously, I'm not going to give full gory details necessarily in this talk, but if you're the sort of person who loves to get the, the, the full story, then you should basically check out the, um, uh, the paper which sort of appeared a couple of months ago in um, mathematical biology. And so, basically, what we are trying to do is combine the world of phylogenetic invariants, which in the title here we call phylogenetic identities, but basically phylogenetic invariants that you've um, just been hearing about with this other idea of Markov invariants. Um, and so we're going to basically um, sort of our, our picture that we're going to have in our mind throughout the talk is this idea of phylogenetics as some kind of a black box. And so on the left hand side of the box we have some sequence data and we throw it into the box and out the other side is going to pop some kind of a phylogenetic tree. Um, and so during this talk, um, what are we going to be putting into the box? We're going to be pretty restrictive. We're just going to think about binary sequence data, and we're only going to think about quartets, so only four sequences at a time. And you might be thinking, hmm, this sounds a bit rather limiting. Um, and so the reason why this, this sort of toy setting, if you like, is, is interesting is because it's a special case where the space of um, a certain class of phylogenetic invariants, in particular the, the edge invariants that I think both Marta and Laura have talked about, actually overlaps with, includes the space of, of Markov invariants. And that's not true in general. So actually, when we submitted the paper, we sort of made this, you know, apology for our, our toy setting. And one of the reviewers said, you know, it's ridiculous to claim this as a toy setting. There's plenty of binary sequence data out there. You know, SNPs are increasingly popular in quartet trees. Of, you know, all you need to get a whole phylogeny. And so they, um, so this is a sort of welcome reviewer comment you get on a, on a paper where you can say, actually, our work is more important than we claimed it was. Um, so what I'm going to focus on today is really, well, what are the properties that we would like this black box to have? And so we all probably can name a lot of different things that, you know, we could put inside this black box here if we wanted to. We could put in, you know, parsimony algorithms or likelihood algorithms or 
neighbor joining or we might say hmm inside my black box I'm going to have a little algorithm that puts all my sequences in alphabetical order and then I'm going to say that the first two um, you know are a, are a split and they belong together you might sort of think well okay you know that would be an algorithm that would produce a tree every time uh, but it might not have you know some very desirable properties would have high bootstrap support but there we go so what are we putting in in terms of what, what, what properties are we sort of assuming about our, our sequence data that's sort of going into this black box. And so our model is basically that we think the evolution really is happening on a, on a tree. So sort of no complicated network evolution is, is going on. Um, and that it's described by a Markov process. So we're assuming all of our sites are sort of independent, identically distributed. Um, and, and that they're evolving according to a continuous time Markov process. So essentially our ingredients could be, you know, some kind of a rate matrix Q, perhaps some edge weights and some sort of distribution of states, sort of zero and one at the root. Um, and I guess it's actually probably a little bit more general than what I've got on the slide here. I've just got a sort of a single Q and then different edge weights, but you could, in principle, have a, you know, a different rate matrix on each edge, and everything that I will talk about would would go through as well. But it is going to be important that our our M's, our probability transition matrices, kind of kind of rise as a sort of continuous time process. Um, and I think that's not true of all sort of phylogenetic invariant methods. Some are, are less restrictive, but the Markov invariants are going to make use of that continuous time. Um, aspect. And so once we've got all those ingredients to our model, then that's basically all we need to define what we're going to call a tree tensor. And by a tree tensor, I just mean um, essentially a list of, in this case, the 16 you know, patterns that, that could occur at the tips. So 0, 0, 0, 0, or you know, 0, 1, 1, 0, all, all the different things that we could see in our modern day species, you know, and with what probability uh, will they occur. And so, so in the picture on the other slide, I sort of drew an actual sequence alignment sort of heading into this, this black box. But you could also um, just as well think of that as being um, you know, a draw um, of, of frequencies of pattern counts that's come from a multinomial distribution that's defined by this, this tree tensor. Um, so multinomial with sort of P, capital P, sort of going to use for this um, this this tree tensor, so all my, my pattern probabilities, and say n different independent sites. Um, one little note, uh, Jeremy and Peter are sort of escaped, or maybe in Peter's case not very escaped theoretical physicists, and they really like to have their rate and transition matrices have column sum, you know, zero and one respectively. So if you see a matrix in this talk, it's sort of two from instead of um, from two. So just, um, and likewise in the, in the paper. So keep that in mind. All right, so let's do a sort of a warm up with a, a first sort of desirable property of our black box. So one of the things that we might like is that I have some sequence data, I put it in the black box and out pops uh, a tree. Um, one thing I should say <clears throat> is I'm sort of distinguishing here between, so my sequence label, so I've got sort of you know, sequence A, B, C, and D, but I've also got these numbers here, one, two, three, four, and so I'm sort of imagining I'm putting sequence A in slot one, sequence B in slot two, and so on. And so um, if I put these sequences into my black box and out pops um, this tree here, then I could sort of notate that in this brief notation here saying I put the thing in slot one and two together away from, you know, the thing in um, things in slot three and four. Now, if I happen to input my sequences in a different order, say I decide I'm going to put sequence B in slot A and sequence A in slot two, um, then what? What one thing I would hope of my black box is that that doesn't actually change, you know, the tree that I get out. And in terms of this sort of shorter notation here, it's sort of saying, well, I'm still going to put thing one and two uh, together away from thing three and four. You can imagine sort of lots of these. Um, symmetries that, that this particular tree has. So if I swap um, you know, A and B, or if I swap C and D, or if I swap both of A and B with, with C and D, like there's all sorts of essentially moves or permutations I can do that shouldn't change my answer. And so this is one obvious desirable property of our black box. 
Um, if I swap, say, you know, A and C, then um, in terms of the tree I get out, hopefully that still doesn't change. But in terms of this sort of, um, you know, what actual, in terms of the order I put sequences in, which ones now go together, now I'd say, hmm, I'm putting sequence one, so in this case, which is now C, with sequence four, which is D. So it's sort of a, it's one of those things that's sort of, it's simple to sort of think to yourself, yes, what, what's the property I want? And then it's hard to, to say it precisely. But basically what we're saying is if we permute our input data, we want our output to permute in some sensible corresponding way. So that's sort of one symmetry that we would um, sort of like our, our black box to respect. Um, and the next symmetry that, if you like, um, that we want our black box to respect is, is perhaps a, one that people don't think of sort of quite as often. And it relies on this idea of um, uh, what we're going to call the Markov action and clipped tensors. So I'll start off just by saying what a clipped tensor is. So I've got over here, um, by the way, Eric, can people see my mouse if I move it around as a pointer? It looks great, yeah. Yep, yep, okay, cool. Um, so so I've got this tree over here on the left, and I've got basically just this sort of internal structure of the tree. And I've drawn these little stubs here to sort of um, leaf one, two, three, and four. Um, but we're really imagining that, you know, these edges in here are, are length zero. So essentially no, um, there's been no chance for evolution to occur to make one and two different from each other or to make um, three and four different from each other. And so we're going to get what we call a clipped tensor. So I'm still thinking of this as, you know, a, sort of a vector, I guess, of, of six, of 16 um, sort of positions in it for the 16 possible patterns. But in this case, there's only four possible patterns that actually could arise. I could get, you know, zero, 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 or one, one, you know, zero, zero, but I can't have anything where one and two don't match or three and four don't match. And so um, our notation is going to be, we'll have a little sort of tilde on top to indicate one of these clipped tensors. And then we say, okay, fast forward, now let's um, sort of grow our tree. And one of the sort of, you know, what, what does this idea of sort of speciation mean kind of um, mathematically? It means independence. So basically, um, we're going to have something independent now happen along an edge to species one and likewise to species two, three, and four. So I've got sort of four um, sort of evolution happening in parallel on these four edges and what happens on any one of those edges has no effect whatsoever on what's happening on the other ones. Um, and so we can we can write that um, sort of algebraically using this, um, this sort of Kronika product notation. So this um, sort of multiplication thingy with a, with a circle around it is the Kronika product. So M1, M2, M3 and M4 are all um, little two by two probability transition matrices. And this whole thing here, the, the, the Kronika product of M1, M2, M3, M4 is going to be a 16 by 16 probability transition matrix. And what it does is it takes us from this clipped tensor um, to a full tree tensor. And that that bit that's basically doing this independent evolution on our pendant edges, um, which we'll often just sort of shorten to, to G, but it's sort of the Kronika product of all of these um, probability transition matrices is what we call the Markov action. Um, and let's think about that Markov action in terms of our, our black box. And so let's say here I have some clipped probability tensor and I'm feeding that into my phylogenetics algorithm, which we'll assume is happy to take probabilities as well as pattern frequencies. And my algorithm says, yep, I think um, the tree here is the one that splits one, two away from three, four. If I go away and let some evolution happen, so I let my edges um, grow um, independently, um, and I move from my clip tensor to a full phylogenetic tensor. I put that in as an ingredient into my black box. What do I hope comes out? I hope <laughs> that the answer doesn't change. So that in a sense, this is kind of another sort of symmetry, if you like, of, of my method is that it should not be affected by evolution on pendant edges. What we're really wanting in a phylogenetic method is, is to return this sort of tree topology. So the internal bit of the tree is the bit that we care about. And in some sense, these um, pendant edges are sort of nuisance parameters. All right, so um, just uh, we have a, I 
this has probably been well covered by the previous two talks, but for the sake of um, being self-contained, let's sort of briefly say what is a phylogenetic invariant. So it's just some polynomial in our, our pattern probabilities and our in our tree tensor. Um, that given some particular tree is going to evaluate to zero for any choice of you know, rate matrix, edge weights, you know, root distribution. So if any phylogenetic tensor that can arise on this tree, that polynomial should be zero. And I guess the interesting ones are invariants that will vanish on some trees, but not on others. Um, I guess it's kind of timely to be doing a series of talks on invariants, given that it seems to be exactly 30 years since um, uh, the, the sort of field of phylogenetic invariants got kicked off by um, um, that should not that should be Cavender and Felsenstein, shouldn't it? That's terrible. Okay, awful typo. Um, so phylogenetic invariants have always yeah yeah. <laughs> um, so phylogenetic invariants have always been you know math mathematically interesting, um, but. I guess after you know, sort of a, a bit of a you know, sort of a, a good start. There was this paper um, by Hillis that came out in 1994 that was a sort of big simulation study that put a lot of different um, um, phylogenetic methods, or I guess completing back black boxes as we would think of them through their paces, and invariants just didn't do very well. And so I think the perception um, sort of came about that while they were mathematically interesting, perhaps they weren't going to be a practical tool for phylogenetic inference. Um, if we go back, you know, sort of nine years, there's a really nice paper by um, Elizabeth Orman and John Rhodes that I think kicked off a bit of a revival in people thinking about phylogenetic invariants and um, their, their uses, and in particular sort of showed that they could be, you know, very useful for trying to sort of sort out questions of identifiability and things like that. Um, so... It's probably, phylogenetic invariants are probably quite um, familiar to people. Um, so, but maybe less familiar is this idea of a Markov invariant. So a Markov invariant is also a polynomial in our pattern probabilities. Um, but the defining feature of them is that they basically are going to scale in a well-determined way with this Markov action. So remembering the Markov action is this independent evolution happening on our leaves. So um, in terms of what, what Jeremy would say, say a Markov invariant is something that transforms as a one-dimensional representation under the Markov action. And so, okay, great. What does what does what does that mean, sort of more mathematically? So, say I've got um, some uh, phylogenetic tensor P, and I'm going to grow my pendant edges for a little while. So I'm going to apply um, this Markov action. If I compute my Markov invariant, so I throw this now, you know, sort of grown extended phylogenetic tensor into um, my my polynomial, get some value. What's it going to be? It's going to be the Markov invariant for this tree tensor, you know, before I've evolved these pendant edges, plus some scalar, lambda, that only depends on G. So it doesn't depend on, on P. So you can see that, yeah, so basically it's, you know, so importantly, a Markov invariant, you know, doesn't have to be um, zero. It, it just has to have this 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 nice sort of scaling property. Um, and there has been, I guess, understandably, a you know a reasonable amount of confusion in some of the literature with you know phylogenetic invariant being used to mean a polynomial that goes to zero, Markov invariant um, meaning something a bit different. And so, in, in the paper, we actually end up using the the terminology identity for polynomials that that evaluate um, you know to to zero. But um, I think that's that's sort of not not too important. So even if you think you haven't ever heard of Markov invariants, you might actually uh, might actually be the case that you have, and that the um, the debt part of the log debt distance is actually a nice example of a Markov invariant. So if we think of this smaller case here, we've just got a tree on on two taxa, um, and so I could think of my little clipped tensor here at the root. It's just going to be something that's sort of zero, got some proportion in state zero zero. Um, nothing in 0, 1 or 1, 0 and some proportion of things in state 1, 1 and I let my um, Markov action happen on my um, on my leaves to, to 1 and 2. Um, then basically the the Markov invariant I can think of here is this sort of like a, a debt 
function on either, you know, here my sort of clipped tensor. And when I compute that same function on my full tensor, it's just going to be, it's going to sort of decompose in this way that I've got this, um, you know, the same sort of function I would have evaluated before that evolution happened in this sort of product of determinants here, um, the determinant of M1 and M2. And so, so you get this sort of multiplication of determinants along paths in the tree, and the log debt distance basically exploits that. So if you take a you know a log of things that are sort of multiplicative, you end up with some sort of additive thing that's sort of summing up along the paths of your of your tree. So so the log debt is kind of the, a nice sort of the the sort of smallest example that you can come up with of one of these Markov invariants. Okay, so a little bit more um, background. So um, we're going to be um, basically playing around in the space of edge invariants that come from flattenings. And I think both of the previous talks have, have mentioned them, but um, I'll do a, a quick sort of recap here as well. So I've got my um, phylogenetic tensor, so my 16 possible patterns I could have that are sort of occurring at some frequency. And I can take that 16 by 1 vector and flatten it into a 4 by 4 matrix. So I'm not changing the entries really at all, I'm just rearranging sort of where they go. And when I do a flattening, I do it based on some particular split. And so here if I flatten my um, my my tree vector based on the split 1, 2 away from 3, 4, then my row indices here are going to um, sort of cope with you know what's happening with the taxa on the left here one and two. And my column indices will be what's happening um, with my my indices on the right three and four. So for instance, pattern J down here. So one and two is in the state we've got sort of one zero. So I'm going to be dealing with this row um, three and four zero one. So I'm going to be dealing with this column. Um, Likewise, I could flatten um, using a different split, the one, three, two, four split. And then when I'm trying to work out what row I'm in, I'm going to look at the first and third position. So here, say one, one. And when I want to know what column I'm putting something in, look at the second and, and fourth position. So you can see these things all have exactly the same values. They're just being sort of moved around, basically, depending on what flattening um, we choose to do. Um, and so it's interesting to think about flattenings on these uh, clipped tensors. So remembering an eclipsed tensor, um, we haven't had any time for evolution to sort of happen between one and two or between three and four, so they're sort of stuck being identical. And so we've only really got four patterns here that could be non-zero. And so if I choose to flatten that using the same split that sort of appears in this tree, so my actual underlying tree the data has arisen on has the split one, two away from three, four, and I flatten um, using that same split, then I end up with um, a matrix over here that has like a bunch of rows and columns that are just zero. And so this matrix has um, rank two. Whereas if I flatten using a split that's not in the tree, then I, in this case, I've got all of my sort of four non-zero values here on the diagonal. I have a matrix that's still rank four. And this sort of interesting fact is basically what, you know, sort of plays into, you know, why these, um, why these um, edge, how we get these sort of phylogenetic edge invariants. Um, and so you can think about, um, so how do I kind of write my, my Markov action that I've talked about before, sort of in terms of these flattening. So I basically got sort of an equivalent way that I can write down, you know, what happens when I start with a clip tensor, apply the Markov action and get to a full phylogenetic tensor, but I can write it down in terms of these um, flattenings. And so what basically happens, it looks a little bit different, is the things that were sort of on the left of my flattening, so one and two are appearing in a Kronecker product you know, on the left here, and the things that are on the right-hand side of the split that I'm flattening by appear you know, on the right-hand side of my clipped tensor in a, a trans, so using T for transpose there, but you know, everything sort of still follows through. I can sort of write down a neat expression for how I get to my flattened sort of tree tensor. Um, and so important thing is, so if we think, um, say this clip tensor is really um, arisen on this tree one, two away from three, four, and so it's a rank um, two thing. So generically, this M1 cross M2 is going to be rank four. M3 um, chronic product with M4 is going to be rank four. So I'm going to have something 
rank four times something rank two times something rank four. And generically, this thing on the left is going to be something that's rank two. And so um, Elizabeth and John sort of basically used this idea to show that, um, you know, this is a great way to get some um, phylogenetic invariance. And so that if you compute the, um, the minors of these flattenings that, um, you know, they're, they're going to be polynomials that will evaluate to zero on, on particular choices of tree. Um, and so that idea was then um, picked up by um, Ericsson as well to basically make a, a sort of a phylogenetic method that, that's explicitly based on sort of looking for something that's as close as possible to, to rank two. And um, Marta and Marta Casnellis and Jesus Fernandez Sanchez sort of um, followed up that um, idea of, of Ericsson's as, as well and um, you sort of modified it um, a little bit as well with um, really what looked like quite um, nice results in the um, sort of four state case. <clears throat> so I'll come back to those methods a bit later on. Um, <clears throat> just quickly say, you know, what exactly a minor is. So I've got these four by four um, flattened matrices. And so a minor, you basically get it by saying, I'm going to pick some row and some column to uh, get rid of. So how many choices have I got of how to do that? Basically, I've got four choices of row times four choices of column. And and so that's going to give me 16 different ways to get to a three by three matrix. And then I'm going to take the determinant of that three by three matrix. And so this gives you um, sort of cubic polynomials in your in your pattern frequencies. So, so that's a minor. And so how many of these um, sort of phylogenetic invariants do we have? So we've got three possible flattenings. Each one has 16 sort of possible minors. So we've got sort of 40, a family of this 48 of these phylogenetic invariants that come out of this edge flattening idea. So you might say, okay, all well and good. What about these um, Markov invariants? How do they come into the story? And so, so first thing we need to think about is um, we're going to do uh, a change of basis. So I've got my sort of probability matrices um, here, um, and I'm just going to apply a, a change of basis that's going to switch them into this sort of upper triangular form. So I always get a zero here. I'll always get a, a one in the bottom right-hand spot, sort of corresponding to probability conservation, and I'll get you know sort of two values. Um, up here, and lambda is kind of the interesting one. Uh, with lambda is the determinant of my original matrix, and you can kind of think of it as something like, you know, like an, an edge length, um, almost for that um, for that matrix. And so everything that I've I've done, I can basically do in this this different basis. So if I have um, say M1 Kronecker product M2, then I can do that in this basis and it's going to preserve this nice sort of upper triangular structure and my determinants sort of end up on the diagonal, on the diagonal here. Um, and it's going to be particularly interesting to look at um, the, just this, this lower, um, this bottom right three by three sub matrix. Um, and so our notation is basically if I'm, if I'm changing to this different basis, I'm going to put a little prime. And if I'm saying, okay, don't look at the whole matrix, just look at this three by three bottom right part, I'll put a, a hat on things. And so we can basically look at that same sort of formula that we were looking at um, before. So uh, we've got this sort of um, what's happening on the left of my flattening bit over here, what's happening on, on the right. So M3. Um, across M4 with the primes and the hat is just going to have exactly the same structure as this matrix up here, but with, you know, lambda 3, lambda 4 on the diagonal. And I can also put my, um, I can put, you know, just my phylogenetic tensor as well on this, this change basis. And so um, basically what this sort of arrow here is saying is I've got some phylogenetic tensor, you know, I apply my Markov action, I let evolution happen a bit more on the leaves, what, what happens to it, and it sort of has this, this same structure that we've seen before. And now if we sort of pick to, to sort of take the determinant of everything there, then what we, what we get is um, a Markov invariant. Um, and so basically it just sort of follows from this um, I guess, a multiplicative um, property of, of the determinant. So you can see these determinants are just sitting here nicely on this diagonal. So out of this bit here, the, this term on the left, I'm going to get my lambda 1, lambda 2. And this term on the right, I'm going to get my lambda 3, lambda 4. And so, 
you can basically see you know what's going to happen when I apply the Markov um, action. So I take this this determinant bit here isn't going to change, but it's going to get scaled by this lambda one times lambda two times lambda three times lambda four. So this is sort of a Markov invariant, um, and it's also in terms of these edge invariants we've just thought about. It's a specific minor in a specific basis. So what have I done here? I've thrown out you know one column, one row, and I've taken the sort of determinant of, of what's left. So it's obviously something that's really related to these sort of edge invariants that we've seen before. Um, and so sort of theorem you know, from the paper is basically saying that um, I can define a, a Markov invariant, I'm calling it here sort of Q1, one meaning because it's come from the sort of one, two versus three, four flattening, is saying I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna flatten my tree tensor according to this one, two, three, four split, change it to this basis, uh, ignore the first row and the first column, take the determinant of that. That gives me you know, a polynomial, and that polynomial is a Markov invariant. Um, and I'm going to get potentially three of these, one for each possible flattening that I could do. Um, and, you know, but wait, there's more. <laughs> so these things are Markov invariants and in that they sort of obey that condition that they sort of scale nicely with the Markov action, <clears throat> but they are also phylogenetic invariants. So if I, again, if I think, so, okay, so what if my um, I have a sort of a clip tensor on um, it's evolved on this tree you know, that splits one, two away from three, four. Then by those sort of same sort of rank arguments, that, that determinant of that um, three by three minor is going to be zero. So these things are Markov invariants, but they are also phylogenetic invariants. Um, a little uh, aside here, um, so you see this slide is titled the squangles. You might be thinking, why is there this imaginary word at the top of the slide? So squangle is not an imaginary word. It's a, it's a, it's a perfectly legitimate word that um, Jeremy and Peter have uh, made up previously. So I mentioned that they have a, a physics background. And so Markov invariants are, are sort of apparently turn up when you study things like entanglement in the in the quantum world and they get called things like being tangles and so when they started looking at these on quartet trees they thought well you know it could be a quartet tangle but it's also important that we've got this continuous time Markov thing going on so it's a stochastic quartet tangle or a squangle uh, so when we started working on this stuff I said well we've got you know these binary squangles because the, the original ones were um, sort of come up with in, in the, the DNA four state case and I said well are we allowed to call them bangles the sort of binary squangles but um, Jeremy and Peter vetoed bangles as a name for these things so they're so they're just still still squangles anyway so we've got three of these uh, squangles these Markov invariants one coming from each of our possible flattenings. Um, so a few interesting things about them. So they're not linearly independent. So um, they must sum for any particular data set if you compute those those three polynomials, they, they sort of have to um, add to zero. Um, but one of the sort of interesting things that, that comes out of the fact that we've sort of, um, our M's are sort of explicitly coming from some continuous time Markov process <clears throat> As we can say, okay, so if my phylogenetic tensor comes from the tree one, two away from three, four, I'm expecting this first squangle, the one that, where the flattening matches the tree to be zero, but I know something quite specific about the other two. I know that they should be um, sort of equal and opposite in sign. And so in particular, I expect um, the one on the one, three away from two, four flattening to be negative, and the one that I get that arises from the one, four away from two, three flattening to be positive. And it turns out that these signs, um, and, and the fact that we know something about what they expect to be, is, is very useful in helping us build a more um, powerful phylogenetic inference technique based on based on these squangles. Um, and so the simulation results at the, at the end of the talk will hopefully sort of convince you of, of the benefit of, um, of what I'm going to sort of talk about here. So let's imagine um, now that we've got some, you know, we've got some real data, we've got some frequency counts and I throw them into my, my three polynomials, my sort of Q1, Q2 and Q3, my Markov invariance, and I get three um, values out. I don't really have to compute all three, I just have to compute two and note that the, you know, the 
so the fact that they must always sort of sum to zero. Um, I'm not probably going to get if I've got some real um, finite data set that one value that Q1 say is exactly zero and these two are sort of equal and opposite. I'll probably get that you know Q1 is, is sort of close to zero but not quite zero. Um, Q2 and Q3 aren't quite you know aren't quite equal. And so I could think of a sort of a um, so my model is making the strong prediction that I should have this. Um, Q2 should be negative, then Q1 should be zero, and then Q3 should be positive in the same magnitude as, as Q1. Sorry, as Q2. And so I can come up with a sort of least squares idea of well, how far do I have to massage these numbers to get them to fit my model? And I can come up with a residual sum of squares. And um, it sort of it works out in this this case because of this sort of dependence between the um, the three squangles. That if you get a situation like this where your data kind of comes in, you know, in, where things are in the expected order, but there's um, you know a little bit of noise, that your residual sum of squares is half your first squangle squared. Um, you could have sort of a different situation. You might say, okay, I've computed these three things, and I'm trying to assess how well they fit on on tree one. I'm expecting um, Q1 to be uh, zero. I'm expecting Q2 to be negative, but oh wait, it's actually you know the largest of my three values. I was expecting Q3 to be positive, but it's actually negative. So then, in terms of a, a, a sort of a least squares or a sort of residual sum of squares kind of idea, what's the best I can do is just say, well, I kind of have to move everything back to zero. So my residual sum of squares in that case is um, the sort of square of my second and third. Squangle. So we're thinking about okay, I've got this. Go back a slide here. Um, you know this this table here. How can I kind of come up with a method for phylogenetic inference? Like the first thing that you might think of is I'll just you know I'll compute these three invariants and I'll just look and see which is closest to zero and I'll pick that you know, as my tree. But actually by using that you know sign information, you can sort of sometimes get you know a different answer from that more sort of simple-minded. I'll just pick the thing that looks um, closest to zero. And this is a so a table from the paper that sort of just gives a sort of a bit of of, of detail on this um, sort of signed squangle idea. So we've got three of these values can come in six possible orders. If they come in one of these top three orders here that matches, you know, one of the rows in in my table with these expected signs, then for sure I'm going to um, you know pick the the tree where. Um, you know, one of these squangles is closest to zero. So say if I get, you know, Q2 is smaller than Q1 is smaller than Q3, so that order matches one that I expect, then I'll definitely return sort of tree one. But there's these three other orders, you know, that, that don't match anything that I expect to see. In that case, so say I get, um, look at this row four here where sort of Q2 is in the middle, so it might be the value that's actually closest to zero, but that's just, this is actually a really a super bad fit because Q1 and Q3 have got you know completely the wrong sign. So actually in this case I'd rule out um, tree two and actually sort of pick between tree one and tree three based on um, which is which of those um, squangles is 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 closest to to zero. So um, so so yeah so that's basically our you know our 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 signed squangle algorithm, a, a way of sort of using these things to try and, and do tree inference or sort of having something to put inside this um, black box. Um, and so in the in the paper, we sort of um, sort of have this idea of a quartet inference measure, which is basically saying we're going to think of all of our different sort of possible black boxes as things that are just returning, um, taking a data set, so F is some um, um, sort of pattern counts and returning some th three numbers which are sort of something like a measure of confidence in um, how much I think you know tree one, tree two or tree three is, is a good fit um, for this data where smaller numbers are, are better. <clears throat> um, one more thing. Uh, Sorry, so just, if you don't yep. mind, um, yep. in that previous slide, so are you saying that uh, that these are distributed multinomially? I mean, is, is that the statement that's being made here? Uh, I'm saying, so I'm assuming that we're assuming that our data is multinomial. So F is just, so we're saying we've got right. um, some right. I see. tree underlying things. We're not necessarily saying that this this measure is multinomial. It could be, um, it could be anything. So it would say neighbor joining, it might be something like, you know, the four point condition <laughs> could, could be what you're, um, 
what your 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 sort of three. I mean, but what does a statistically that? interpretable confidence mean mathematically? Yeah. Um... Well, never mind. So I mean... Some some kind of measure of I guess it's some kind of measure of of fit. But yeah, I mean, I think. Mm, I'll take a pass on that question, Eric, and, and all right. um, that's all good. <laughs> I'll bat, bat that one to bat it to Jeremy. <laughs> so one thing um, that 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 we that we also sort of thought about a little bit is that you know when we when we're doing this sort of residual sum of squares type idea. Um, we're not actually using the squangle functions themselves. We're using their um, squares of these squangle functions. Um, and it turns out that if I've got some actual data, some counts here, and I compute a, a sort of a square of this um, sort of squangle, that's actually a biased estimator of um, the, the squangle on my on some underlying sort of probability tensor under under the sort of multinomial sampling and so um, Jeremy went away and did a bit of reading and found um, sort of basically a, a way of um, sort of modifying these polynomials to make them unbiased estimators of the squares of the squangle um, and so in terms of like you know kind of what size polynomials are we talking about so our our squangles I think have like 90 sort of cubic polynomials with 96 terms. When you do this um, bias correction, you end up with things with um, sort of 6,000 and, and something terms. So it sort of blows out the amount of um, computation you have to do. But I think we'll, we'll sort of see later on that it does actually sort of seem to be important. And and so we sort of went away when we we're working on this, and we sort of got um, some nice results for our sort of signed squangles and. And they did, you know, quite a lot better than this idea of, you know, sort of, um, you know, looking at, um, you know, these these miners. But we sort of thought well, it's actually not really fair because we we can't really sort of tell if that's necessarily anything to do with this property of being a Markov invariant, or if it's something to do with this property of um, making use of this the sign information, this expectation. And we sort of realised that actually, in the same way as you can use that sort of um, residual sum of squares or expected signs to um, improve what you're getting out of um, <clears throat> the, um, the the squangles, our Markov invariants, you can do the same thing with the edge invariants. And so I said um, we're getting 16 of these edge-based invariants for each of the, the three flattenings. And in the, the same sort of way as there's a, you know, a linear dependence between the squangles, there's actually a whole set of linear dependencies between these um, 48 edge invariants. And so <clears throat> we've sort of got a, a, a table where you can say, um, define what are all the, the algebraic relationships between miners that come from the, the three flattenings. And so I think we've got this. So how do we interpret this table? So if you just sort of look at this first row here. Um, so I've got, so this is saying, okay, I'm thinking about my um, flattenings on the one, two away from three, four tree, and one comma one meaning I've deleted it's the, the minor that comes from getting rid of the first row and the, the first column. And so I can come up with a, you know, an algebraic relationship between um, you know, the, the sort of triples of, of flattenings from each, of, sort of one from, from each of the, um, the different flattenings. So the one, one flattening from, you know, my, um, sort of minor from the first flattening minus this one one minor from the second flattening um, minus the one one flattening one one minor from the third flattening um, should all be zero and so this table is saying okay well what should this sign here be sort of plus or minus in this case it should be minus um, if my data has really come from this um, from the tree, one, two away from three, four, I expect everything in this column here to be zero, but I also have an expected sign for these other two flattenings. And so here in this this first case here, I expect both this one and this one, I expect them to be equal and that they should both be positive. So for different sort of linear combinations, some, sometimes you're expecting them to be positive, sometimes you're expecting them to be negative, but you can, um, you can basically 
develop sort of a set of these um, sort of linear relationships and expectations about signs. And so using that, we could come up with a, essentially a, a modified phylogenetic invariant based on these these edge invariants that rather than just saying, okay, I'm expecting all these things to be zero, so I'll sum them up and see you know how close I get, a sort of unsigned minor idea, I can do something like that residual sum of squares idea with the with the edge invariants as well. And so this kind of brings us to the well how to how does this all sort of work out? So um, time for a, a sort of a simulation study, I guess. And so what are our contestants? So we've got a um, couple of um, methods based on the, the edge invariants, the miners. Um, so just an unsummed version that says I'll um, compute these 16 um, miners for each flattening and I'll sort of sum, you know, do a, just, just sum them up, sum, do, do a sum of squares and pick the one where where the sum's closest to zero, so the smallest one. I've got um, a version of the miners that's actually using explicitly this information about what, you know, the linear um, combinations and what, what sort of expectations we have about whether things should be positive or negative. Um, so it's this sort of residual sum of squares idea. <clears throat> I've got um, the methods based on singular value decomposition and sort of using the idea that these matrices should have, you know, rank two, so ERIC SVD, um, and the recent sort of proposed modification to that. And then we've got three sort of versions of our Markov variants or squangles, sort of an, uh, sort of the, the simplest idea, pick the thing that's closest to zero. Um, the signed idea that's sort of using this sort of residual sum of squares and the bias corrected signed sum of squares. And so I guess four of these methods are sort of new. These two here, I'll put new star and that there were they, they knew in the sense that they hadn't been developed before for binary data, but um, these ideas had been developed for, for, for four state data previously. And of course, no simulation study is complete unless you also compare to, to neighbor joining. Right, so let's uh, sort of think about our contestants here, or if you like, have a little form guide for how they, they might go. And so <clears throat> we sort of can think of three properties, I guess, that we might like our, our methods to have. So property one was this idea that, you know, you do sensible things if you permute your your input. Now, all of our methods have this property. You might say, you know, why sort of bother to include it? It actually turned out to be an enormously useful debugging tool for when, when um, you know, sort of writing the code for this. So, um, so Amelia and I did sort of parallel implementations of these methods. I think I used Python and she used R and we had a, it was sort of a reasonable amount of fiddly linear algebra. So it was sort of useful actually to to do um, checks on the code using this property one where you just basically do sort of reorder your input data and check that your output changes in, a, in the way you expect. Um, property two, so behave sensibly under the Markov action. These properties are all written a bit more formally in terms of that um, sort of quartet inference measure idea in, in, in the paper. But um, and so we've got two versions of this property. So the, the, the weak version says that this would be true in some limit if you had infinite data. And the strong version says, you know, this is just true also for, for finite data. And the only two methods that have that sort of strong property too are the bias corrected squangles and neighbor joining. Property three is basically saying, do you kind of make use of the fact explicitly that that you thinking that there's a continuous time Markov process sort of happening sort of um, sort of underneath the hood. And so it's basically the, these expectations you have about the signs are coming from the fact that, that, that this is a continuous time Markov um, process. And so the methods that have that, signed squangles, the bias corrected signed squangles, the signed minors, so this is the sort of modification to the edge invariant idea and, and also neighbor joining. So if we sort of look across that, we can see the corrected Squangles and neighbor joining seem to have all three properties. Everything else is, is missing something somewhere or other. So it, should it be obvious to us why the like original squangles should not have the prop strong property too? Um, so it's, it's ba basically there, if you have, um, yeah, so they, 
I think yeah. So it's it's basically because of the fact that they that they that they that they're biased. Um, I don't know. So I struggle to um, struggle to sort of put it into words simply, but it definitely we can certainly see that it does actually um, make a big difference when we when we sort of have a look at the have a look at the um, performance. But I'll, I'll, I might sort of come come back to that um, okay. at the end. Cool. Um, so we did a few different simulations. So this first one here, just on a, a sort of a balanced but probably difficult tree, where you've got a you know a short internal edge and um, sort of four fairly long pendant edges. And here you can sort of see where there's not there's a sort of a set of good methods and a set of not good methods. And the ones that are good are all the ones with this property three. So that's the thing to do with you know um, making use of the fact that you that this thing is coming from a continuous um, time. Um, process the um, so you sort of straight methods just on based on either the miners or the, the, um, the you know the Markov invariants that sort of don't make use of that that sign information so they're basically just saying look I'll pick um, I'll pick the thing that's closest um, to being to being zero uh, sort of not doing particularly well I mean they are doing slightly better with increasing sequence length but um, so this, so we've got uh, each simulation. We've got a sort of thousand trees. So I guess guessing you'd expect to be right about, you know, somewhere around. So guessing is about here, I suppose. So they're a little bit better than guessing, but, but not uh, enormously so. And there's really nothing to sort of choose between um, the other methods, particularly. If we go to a um, Felsenstein style tree. So I've got three short branches, two um, long branches. Um, then we see sort of getting a different picture. So I've got sort of uncorrected neighbour joining here, which is sort of inconsistent. So it's going to be um, sort of increasingly guaranteed to be wrong with with larger sequence length. And I've got these the set of methods here um, that doesn't have this um, sort of property um, property three. So Eric plus two. This is the modification to that rank based idea. Is here here is doing a lot better than just the um, the idea just just purely looking at rank. So it seems to, um, that modification does certainly seem to help in that sort of Felsenstein zone region. Um, not too much to pick between, um, say, signed squangles or signed miners or neighbour joining, but in this sort of bias corrected um, signed squangles are, are doing it sort of a little bit better than, than everything else. Um, we also tried some sort of um, Ferris tree simulations, and we did this, this sort of star tree um, simulation where there's sort of no internal edge length. So basically, so this is sort of checking for bias. So if a method's working well here, so if not here saying number of times you're getting the tree correct, because there isn't really a correct tree, but you're just saying, well, what's the number of times that you group the long edges um, together? Um, and so, so this is sort of you know the classic case of you know say you know parsimony on on the the ferris style tree will be um sort of biased to, to put sort of two short edges together see the same sort of thing going on here um uncorrected neighbor joining is very rapidly just always picking to put say the short edges together um and so we'd argue that a good result here is to be hovering around you know a third of the time doing that that sort of sort of effectively un, unbiased and we so think these um, the sort of bias corrected um, sign squangles seem to be doing, um, um, you know, a nice job in terms of being less less biased. And then you can see also it is interesting this sort of difference between the Eric plain Eric SVD method and the Eric plus plus two is 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 quite marked in this um, plot as well. Um, so all those were um, sort of fixing the tree and increasing sequence length. So we also um, tried a simulation where we fixed the sequence length at 800 and said, OK, I'll vary the length of this internal branch and sort of see well, how long does it have to be before I get power to get the correct tree. And in that case, we see sort of similar similar sort of results that you're getting um, you know, a good result for this sort of bias corrected um, squangles. And of course, you can do um, you can have some fun in the in the Felsenstein zone. So here I've got just I've just picked out four. So SM that's so the signed miners, SS signed squangles, CSS 
bias corrected squangles and, and neighbor joining. And it's the sort of top right bit, which is where you're, you're sort of in the trickiest part of the Felsenstein zone. We've got the shortest internal edge lengths and the longest pendant edges. And it's sort of interesting here, actually, I think the signed miners, if anything, are actually doing a little bit better than the signed squangles. There's not too much in it, but pretty much all of these um, cells here, so this is number of trees right out of a thousand, uh, are doing a bit better um, than, than over here. Um, the bias corrected version of the, the squangles sort of is doing, is again, doing best of all. And so I think it's sort of, it's sort of pretty interesting to sort of, when you look at those results and go back and sort of reflect on that sort of table of um, desirable properties that uh, sort of that that sort of taking the effort to think about the expected signs and say okay rather than um, sort of sort of stopping uh, when you would I guess um, with the, the, you know, the sort of algebraic satisfaction of saying, okay, I've developed these polynomials and I know that, you know, they should be zero on these particular trees, um, sort of taking it a step further and saying, okay, I'm going to think about this more like a, you know, a statistical model and it's giving me some explicit prediction that these quantities should be sort of negative, these should be positive, and then putting it in that sort of um, residual sum of squares type framework really seems to make, um, I think, you know, the, the sort of the biggest difference. I mean, obviously we're really interested in this, um, you know, the Markov invariant side of the story, so property um, property two. Um, and that does sort of seem to help, but, but maybe not so much. If you think about, um, come back to that table. So our um, signed version of the miners, they don't actually have, this property two in weak or strong form, but they're still actually doing, um, you know, pretty well. I mean, this corrected um, sign squangles, which sort of does have the the strong version of this this property, um, is is doing better. But um, it seems like just having the weak version of of the property isn't isn't actually helping you out that much. And there wasn't really any appreciable difference between the sign squangles and the the signed miners. It wasn't until you did that bias correction that you that you saw things actually, you know, starting to get in a, um, a sort of performance improvement. And so, yeah, so just to sort of sum up, I think like this two state case is it's kind of fascinating because you've got these edge invariants and the mark of invariants sort of inhabiting the same space. So you kind of think of your um, your, your Markov invariance is some sort of special, I guess, linear combination of your um, of your your edge invariance, um, and so. But it's just that you've picked some, I guess, unique basis that's sort of respecting um, the, the Markov action as well as these these sort of leaf permutation symmetries. Um, and so, unfortunately, in the the four state case, um, if you think about the the sort of the space that you get. Um, from these edge invariants, it actually doesn't contain any Markov invariants. I mean, you can still you can still find Markov invariants. You can still find Markov invariants that are also phylogenetic invariants, but they just they don't sort of inhabit this this nice sort of space of ones you can define through these um, you know uh, sort of splits and flattenings and and that that sort of rank those rank ideas. Um, obviously, it'd be nice to be able to get a bias correction in the, the four-state case, given that we seemed like it really sort of looked like it helped, but we can't work out you know, how, how to do this. So that's an open problem if anyone um, wants to um, have a think about that. And so open problem, I've said here, is, is special code for an absolute nightmare. <laughs> it looks like you know your polynomials would just get just unbelievably huge. Um, so it's pretty much all I want to say. I've got a few references here. Um, so this is, you know, the the talks basically just gone through some of the results in this this reasonably recent paper. Um, and yeah, just to say they build on a like a. And this is an incomplete, but it, but a lot of work by you know Jeremy and, and Peter over the you know the last sort of decade or so on trying to understand how you can bring some of these useful ideas from entanglement theory and physics into the world of into the world of phylogenetics and get some sort of bang for buck out of them. Um, and Eric, I hope you won't mind, but here's a short advertisement for Phylomania 2017, if you like phylogenetics. 
um, and think like you might like a trip down to the southern hemisphere then um, we'll be ha having a sort of three-day meeting um, this December in, in the, the awfully dreadful island of Tasmania. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks very much, Eric, for giving me the chance to, to, to talk through this this work. And I apologise for not being able to <laughs> give really good answers to some of those those um, questions. But I know for sure that um, like the, the the wider author team, in particular, you know, Jeremy would be probably better placed to answer some of the the more um, detailed questions. Wow, uh, thank you very much. Um, that was a very very interesting talk. I, I'm sorry, I'm just a little bit distracted by these pictures. Moment. Maybe you can make it go away. I'll make uh, it go away. Here we go. <laughs> references. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll take any questions that folks have through IRC or Twitter. Um, maybe I'll start things off. Um, I mean, this is a totally cool idea. Uh, I mean, there's sort of two different parts, right? There's the like the Markov invariant part, but there's also there's this. Uh, well, there's symmetries in the values of the invariants that then you can use to get more, you know. More sort of statistical power, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we found that really interesting. Yeah. So for that latter thing, I mean, could you use these for more, it, do, do a sort of similar sorts of symmetries exist, you know, sign symmetries exist for say just normal phylogenetic or edge invariants or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So they certainly, I, I think they def. Yeah. So I don't. I yeah. I mean, I, I don't know, but I think it would be unlikely that it's something sort of just particularly special about edge invariance in the binary case that they have these sort of linear um, relationships. Um, I would. Yeah. I'm. Not, I'm probably. Yeah. Would be really. <laughs> this is the the trouble with giving a talk in this format. Is you sort of expect there's probably people listening that have good answers to this question. Well, <laughs> like, so, um, you know, like Elizabeth or John, or <laughs> might be right. Really, um, good people to. Um, yeah, you know, they to, might be uh, in evolution right now, but anyway. Um, yeah, they're off enjoying themselves in Barcelona. Sorry. Oh right. Yeah. Anyway, well, so, but I mean, it does. Yeah, it's rather late in Barcelona right now. Um, but but yeah. So I, I mean, it seems like this same idea could be really helpful there as well. That's yeah, I think um, like one of the things that I think Jeremy was really keen on was sort of not to stop at the point where you've got something that has this sort of, okay, we've developed another polynomial that evaluates to zero, but to sort of try and sort of bring it into the framework of being a, you know, a sort of a statistical inference problem and then thinking, okay, well, what, like sort of things like thinking about sort of ideas like, like bias and that you want your, um, um, yeah, that, you, that you're sort of looking for, okay, how do you take the next step and turn it into a good sort of statistical genetic method as, as well as a, you know, a really nice algebraic sort of idea. I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of just what I was also like, uh, I mean, is there some sort of uncertainty quantification that can be done like, a, I don't know, some sort of central limit theorem -y sort of deal um, that you're getting more and more confident? Uh, as the as the data accumulates, yeah, that I mean that's sort of an interesting thing to think about. That you always still were, and sort of you're like you're coming back and you're you're picking, um, you know, one, um, one tree. But I mean, we sort of if you have these sorts of these measures. So say this is your 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 um, bias corrected sort of residual sum of squares idea, like. Um, what do we mean? This was a question you had going through by sort of statistically interpretable. Is that you kind of hope that you know maybe you could think of these, you sort of rescale these things to say, well, what's my confidence in a particular tree? I mean, obviously, if I'm getting a sort of residual of zero on one thing and something else on the other two, I could maybe I'm you know 100% confident in in this particular tree. But if if you're getting something that's where these three values are, are more similar to each other, you know, you maybe you might not be you know sort of you know, if you did sort of R1 divide R1 plus R2 plus R3, is that giving you something like a sort of posterior probability of how much you should believe a particular tree? And I think that's what um, we're sort of trying to get at with this idea of um, statistically interpretable confidence. But I, yeah, I don't, I haven't really 
possibly really sort of properly thought through well what does that mean sort of for all the different methods that we've sort of thrown into this this simulation study but I guess that was sort of what we're at least hoping for these residual sum of squares sort of based based ideas and, um, I mean I, I guess it sort of follows somewhat but I mean I guess if you used a court like an, an inference uh, like a full tree inference algorithm on a larger than four sequence data set that these methods should like perform better um, because they do better on each quartet I mean if you were going to sort of take things into quartets and then and but, often I guess if you've got yeah so if you if you're going to try and turn this into um, yeah a, a sort of a, a phylogenetic inference method for um, for larger trees then some of the methods that are out there for um, going from a set of quartets to a tree can make use of this sort of information um, so so rather than just sort of picking your, your favorite for every quartet you can actually um, give sort of confidence confidence sort of weights in your in your quartets and that you would expect would help improve the accuracy of any sort of phylogenetic um, bigger sort of phylogenetic inference um, where, you, where you're trying to puzzle your quartets back together. Right. Cool. It, it is a, oh, and just so I know, I mean, the corrected neighbor joining, that's that's just neighbor joining with sort of corrected distances. Is that yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, I, um, yeah, so it, that algorithm is amazing, can I just say. Like, um, I that's, know. Well, that's why we said at the end here. You know, it's really difficult to be corrected. That for yeah. Such a wonderful, such a wonderful, um, wonderful, fast, simple idea. <laughs> we, we, we were, we were quite delighted that we, we could see daylight here. <laughs> right. the, the corrected, um, sign squangles and, and, and neighbour joining here. We thought that was, that was, it was good and somewhat unexpected. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, of course, neighbor joining is giving you more information and it's giving you edge links as well. We're just giving you topology, so. And let's see, so this is really for binary, like data under a binary symmetric? No, no, just binary. It doesn't have to be symmetric. Uh -huh. So, so gen general, general, whatever the general GMM is on two state data. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> the general. Uh, <laughs> But I mean, I guess your simulations were still for the binary symmetric case. Uh, yeah, them. yeah. So we simulated. Now I'm just trying to remember if we did all our simulations on a, a binary symmetric, or if we did some. I think I think they all were all binary symmetric. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's about all my questions. Um, I think everybody is actually at evolution at the moment, but um, they'll get to watch it afterwards. But thank you very much for your talk. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> um, and we'll stop there. I think we're going to take a bit of a break for the summer, but um, we'll be back after that. So. Cool. We'll look forward to it.